there has been some absolutely blessed news from Mongolia. That's right, in this video, Mongolia has decided to change its alphabet, and I want to find out why. Now, fairly recently, I covered Mongolia and Inner Mongolia, which is all in China, in another video, which you can watch if you want a bit on the history and background there. But in this video, I'm going to focus specifically on the type of script and the language that's being used. Now, this is going to be about Mongolia, so the country of Mongolia. But as I said, there is also an Inner Mongolia and to try and trace where the script came from, because obviously when we think of Cyrillic, we, we think of Russian. But this is actually how you would write Mongol in the Cyrillic alphabet, which was and is currently in use in Mongolia. However, there is another way of writing this that isn't in the Cyrillic alphabet or the Latin alphabet, which paradoxically Cyrillic is written in the Latin alphabet there, which is this. And this is the traditional Mongolian script, uh, which, which is usually referred to just as Mongolian script. And this is still the one that's used in Inner Mongolia in China by the Mongols there when they are writing things down. But also there is, it is also in use in Mongolia as well, but not in an official capacity. But that is what is going to change. Now let's dive right back into the deep past and look into these scripts and start with a people called the Jianbe. And these people, they were around around the turn of the millennium, the first century AD and a little bit forward. They were a nomadic people. And so they didn't really have that much a use for a script. Generally, when they're nomads, they didn't have that much to write down or to stay in one place. But we do know that they were using the Chinese alphabet, the Chinese script to write things down, but then just spelling out their language, the Jianbe language, which may have been a proto-Mongolic language, possibly a Turkic language, so one of the great, great ancestors of the modern Turkish, as well as many, many other languages as well. But they were just using Chinese characters to do this. Zooming forward in time to the 10th century, we come to another para-Mongolic people called the Khitan, and they do have their own script. In fact, they have two. They have one that's called the Kitan large script because it's large and one called the Kitan small script because it's sm small. Uh, yeah, I guess. So the Kitan are very interesting because they have their own script. And in fact, they have two scripts to write down their language, which again appears to be a Mongolic language. And it's thought that there wasn't much left of this at all, apart from several monuments. But actually in 2002, in uh, Berlin, they found some, some figures that, that had been preserved in glosses. So a gloss is where you write over a, 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 in a, a language that you don't understand. You write in the words that you do. So they, I think, believe it was a Chinese gloss and they wrote over the Kitan words. So that was discovered in 2002. And then eight years later in 2010 in St. Petersburg, they actually discovered that this whole page was in the Kitan script. It had been misidentified as a different script, but this is the Kitan large script. And there's also, uh, as I said, carvings in the smaller script that, that exist as well. What's interesting is that if you look at the large script, you can see that it's that it's written vertically. Uh, the characters are clearly based off the, the Chinese script. So again, it's based off the Chinese script. That was, of course, who they were interacting with largely, uh, the, the most literate culture that these nomadic peoples were interacting with. And so it's based off the Chinese script, but it is its own script in its own right. Now, what's interesting is that the other script, this small script, was written from left to right, so not vertically. And that's interesting as well, because that will come up later again. Now, I often talk about more kind of things in Europe, so it, it's fun to draw some comparisons, which is that th these peoples had been illiterate and then they picked up a script. It was probably based off a, a Uyghur script, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But it's comparable maybe to looking at the Germanic peoples who around the turn of the millennium, the first century AD, they were an illiterate people. But after having contact with the Romans, some of them serving as auxiliaries, they developed their own script, the runic alphabet. This will have been the, the elder Fuvark at this time. But it's clearly based off um, a, a Latin alphabet or several Latin alphabets um, with influences from others perhaps as well, which is interesting that they, they developed this similar to the Latin alphabet. It, perhaps we can see the Ketan script being developed or the Ketan scripts being developed in a similar way with inspiration from the Chinese, but clearly changing it to match their own language and linguistic needs. But I hear you say, what about the actual Mongol script? Because while the Kitan and the Xianbe are interesting, it's not the Mongols that we came here to see. Well, as ever, if you ask a question about why the Mongols have something 
do something, look like something, the answer is probably going to be Chinggis Khan, or more likely you know him as Genghis Khan in English, actually is responsible for the creation of the traditional Mongolian script. And this occurred in 1204 when he defeated the Naiman, who were another nomadic tribe, I believe another Mongolic tribe. He defeated them, and when he defeated them, he captured a Uyghur scribe that was working for them. And he actually got this Uyghur scribe to show him the Uyghur script, although uh, Chinggis Khan actually never learned how to write himself. But he got him to adapt this Uyghur script that had been used, the Uyghur language is I believe a Turkic language, so um, uh, from a different language family, but also with a lot of similar sounds in it. So they adapted the Uyghur script to make a new, and this is a, an example of the old Uyghur script that you can see. So again, it's vertical, but it's quite different from the Chinese scripts that we've seen before. You see the line running down, that's quite a characteristic feature. And then from this, you can also see that this is a, a left to right script that's being used. Um, and this is interesting because actually this is the only language Mongolian is, uh, the only script that's written for vertically, but from left to right. So if you imagine you read left to right, but it's vertically. So you start on the left side of the page and you go down and then you go to the right. Whereas the others that are vertical, you start on the right side of the page, then go down and then continue to the left. So that's a very interesting thing. And that's because it's based off the, the Uyghur script that did something similar as well, based on Chinese fashion. So this is what the traditional Mongolian script looks like. And this is his name. This is Chinggis Khan written in the Mongolian script. Now, while this is the script that survived to us today, there are several variations and different scripts that were derived from this that have been introduced and come and gone through the years. And some are actually still really quite visible in Mongolia in certain ways. Now, one of these was in 1269 in the reign of the probably the second most famous Mongol, which is Kublai Khan. And in his reign, he was obviously based far more in China than Chinggis was. Uh, he was, you know, I think, I can't remember what the, the Sinified, Sinified, Mandarified. There's a special term that you use for, for someone who becomes particularly embroiled in Chinese culture. And I'll put it up in a, in a little label because I temporarily can't remember the name. But basically, Kublai Khan, he was very much more of a, a, a Chinese emperor in many ways. And so he wanted a script that was, that you could write the phonology of Chinese and other languages from the empire in as well and this script became known as the Fags Pa script and this is the name of the the Buddhist monk who he tasked with this job because he wanted to be able to write Chinese as well as probably to a lesser extent maybe Tibetan uh, in in this script as well as of course M Mongolian because the Mongolian script is not well suited at all to writing Mandarin in so he he got this guy to, to make a new script to make that easier now while this fell out of use in uh, the Yuan Empire when that fell in the mid 14th century. It is important to note because some scholars actually think that it's this script that based the current most popular script that's being used in Korea, which is Hangul. And that this, uh, this basically the, the Fags Pa script is, you can see on the left a bit of the Fags Pa, and then you can see on the right the Hangul script, and there is something in that. Of course, my eye is incredibly untrained because I can't read either of these scripts, so perhaps these are quite different if you actually read Hangul or, or, or know the Fags Pa script, which would be phenomenal. Please leave a comment if you do. But I can sort of see that the shapes are, are fairly similar in that way, so that will be interesting, even though it's not really, the Fags Pa script is no longer used. Now, in 1587, there was a, I believe it was a translator, he created this, which is another script called the Gaelic script. I think you'll find it's pronounced Gaelic. Yeah, there's not much more to say about that. I just wanted to in include that joke. Apart from that it was probably inspired, it was it was done by a, a monk and a translator because it would be easier to go from Tibetan and Sanskrit, which of course are incredibly important language for Buddhists because so many of their key texts are, are written in those languages. So it was easier to go from the one to the other and that's why I created this script because it would make it easier uh, to get the phonology right in that way. Now around 1700, towards the end of the, the 17th century, going into the 18th century, there's another script that's, that's called the Soyombo script and this is uh, based it's the the monk was called Soyombo and again this is what it looks like it's a bit more angular you can see there are different features appearing it's a bit more stylistic again it's thought that this has Tibetan influence to it he's a monk so he's probably reading Tibetan and all these kinds of things and actually you've probably most actually you've all seen this before this script even if you didn't know it and that's because it appears on the Mongolian
Mongolian flag. So the modern Mongolian flag that you can see there of the Republic, the symbol there in gold is actually called the Soyombo symbol, and it's one of the, the symbols from the script. And I believe it's also quite, you can see this script quite popularly, quite commonly in Buddhist temples as well in Mongolia and shrines and other places that it is used in that kind of ecclesiastic context as well, which is interesting because that, that does add another dimension, but it's on the Mongolian flag. And so it's, uh, it's definitely a worthwhile one to talk about and a different script, as you can see, clearly a different script to the one, the, the traditional Mongolian script that was used. Now in 1924, obviously we've jumped a little bit in time here, but this is when we get the Mongolian People's Republic. So this, this communist regime that comes in in, for, in power in Mongolia, that, which is aligned, of course, with the Soviets who had just won their civil war in Russia. Now, I'm not sure exactly what script they were writing when they came to power, probably a combination. Some might have been writing in Chinese characters. Of course, it had been Chinese until 1911 and then sort of intermittently. But in 1930, actually, surprisingly, there was a period when they took on the Latin alphabet. So this alphabet that you can see in front of you here. And this is rather surprising when we think of the history of Mongolia. It kind of makes sense to think of, you know, Chinese characters, of course, a lot of interplay with China and even in a way with the Cyrillic, because I guess communism coming out and taking over and being next to Russia. But they did this because the Soviets were actually pursuing a Latinization. In the 1920s and the 1930s, they were, you know, trying to become more modern in a way and to break from the past and the past that had been associated with Cyrillic. And so they were pursuing you know, Latinizing. This eventually didn't take off, of course, because that's why today Russia still uses the Cyrillic alphabet. But Mongolia did so too. And this is actually an extract of Mongolian that you can see, but it's written in the, the script. And potentially at the start of the video, I should have made clear what the difference is between a language and a script, but I'm hoping you've all got that so far. Otherwise, it won't have made much sense. But this is basically Mongolian written down, but in the Latin alphabet. That is until 1941. And of course, 1941, they actually go over and they take on the Cyrillic alphabet instead of the Latin alphabet. So they change everything up again. And this is because this was, of course, slap bang in the Second World War. Mongolia played a very interesting role. And even in the last video, I said I have to make a video about this, which I still haven't done, but I will do that at some point. They were also fighting alongside the Soviets. So there was a very close relationship between the uh, People's Republic of Mongolia and the USSR at the time. And so with Soviet pressure, they actually took over uh, the the Cyrillic alphabet. But the problem was that Cyrillic actually didn't have all the right letters for all the noises that one can make in Mongolian. And these are actually two uh, letters that were introduced to the Cyrillic alphabet and are unique to Mongolian Cyrillic because you need these sounds, the O with the umlaut and the U with the umlaut to, to, well, to speak Mongolian, to pronounce the different sounds that are there that didn't exist in Russian, for example. And so these were added into the Mongolian script of Cyrillic so that they could better, pr well, pronounce the language and better write out the language. Um, and again, they kept this because of this Soviet pressure. They were obviously, uh, the governments were closely related with one another because of the, the communist systems that were in place in both of them. But, uh, you know, the traditional script did continue as well, but outside of official usage. And this was the official script, unquestionably so, until 1990, when Mongolia democratized, they had the democratic revolution, and there was talk about transitioning back, revoking the Cyrillic script in official business, and going back to using the traditional Mongolian script, which of course the people across the border in Inner Mongolia, within the People's Republic of China, they, they had been writing in this script the entire time, as well as, of course, non-official people also using that uh, alongside Cyrillic. And obviously now in the modern internet age, I, I know a few uh, people in Mongolia, they also just write things out uh, in, in Latin as well on the internet because it's it, because it's easier in the Latin alphabet. So there's an awful lot of choice. But that was the case uh, in 1990. They decided not to revoke it, even though they'd become democratic. They decided they'd have the Cyrillic alphabet for a long time, which is fair enough. But in 2020, so 30 years later, the government has now decided that by 2025, they want everything to be in the traditional Mongolian script and to, to get rid of Cyrillic in an official capacity which is incredibly interesting. So we'll see the disappearance 
of Cyrillic in Mongolia in this official capacity and instead we'll see vertical. So I wonder what they're going to do with the road signs honestly. There is actually, I mean I know what they're going to do and I, you know, I didn't say that by accident but there is actually a, also a folded version so that you can write across and that's what they use for banknotes in case you were wondering. The banknotes aren't incredibly long in Mongolia but there's there's a way of writing it horizontally as well so I guess that's what they'll be doing in a, in a lot of cases but it'll certainly be very interesting to see how they do this, how they accomplish this shift in scripts that they use to, to write their language. But I thought this was incredibly interesting. I hope you have too. Um, it's really nice to, to go back and to look at some of the script history of, of completely different alphabets because actually for my um, course at university, Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic, I look at a lot of different scripts and alphabets and their development in one of my papers, which is paleography. Um, and but then it's obviously with the, the Latin alphabet and with the runic alphabet especially so it's very interesting to look sort of at a system that I can't read whatsoever and have no idea about but to see some similarities there uh, with different languages being written in different scripts and it being harder to write certain languages in different scripts and that's why people change over but anyway thank you so much for watching everyone I hope this has been interesting give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it you know I'll, I'm sure there'll be some great uh, discussions in the comment section below there'll be links and other things in the description as well as uh, obviously to the the other video on on the uh, inner Mongolia as well as the the religion of the Mongols I did a video on that on Tengrism um, and some other things so thank you so much for watching I've been Hilbert and this has been the history